very familiar scripture. I want to read this out of the NIV. And I need you to know up front that it's a, I'm very passionate about this particular scripture. So I pray you would allow me the time because I see something happening in the body of Christ. And it's not a good thing. I see a, I see a, a shift in the body. And it's not a shift for the good. But look at Romans, the eighth chapter. I, I, I'm just going to read verse 35 through 39, but in your leisure, you can read verse 28. Verse 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It may not have sound like much to some of you because maybe you've never read this or even studied the book of Romans. I want to talk to you from a very simple subject I'm convinced. Just look at somebody and say, I'm, I'm convinced. And, and if you're not convinced yet, I pray that at the close of this message that you will be convinced. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us now. Grant us your grace and your mercy. Thank you in advance for revelation knowledge today. Allow your word to come forth with power and conviction. Send a fresh anointing, an anointing that makes preaching effective. Thank you now in advance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sit with me if you will. Before I go into this, I thank God for Deacon Coles being here with us today. Thank God for what God is continuing to do with him. Amen. Please be seated, baby. As I said, I, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about this particular scripture, and you might wonder, why are you so, so passionate, Pastor? Well, We've got some things going on in uh, not just the world, not just the United States of America, but in this world. There's so much happening, and the younger generation, to some degree, seems to be brushing it off, and even not even just the younger generation. But brushing things off as 
not concerned. Uh, right now, we're uh, in Washington, D.C., there's, uh, there's an impeachment process in place to impeach the present administration. And uh, the president is calling everybody involved. He's calling them crazy. And you know, back in the day, they used to say it takes one. Crazy, no, crazy. Uh, people are demonstrating in the streets all over the place. There's a, there's a virus going around. Uh, I came through customs and saw all these masks, and I thought I was being held up. We'll get that when we get home. But, but, but all these different things that are going on, ac accusations of, of tampering with elections and uh, things that you have not heard of before, racial tension has been heightened. And there has even been uh, someone, I don't know how serious it was, but an but $80 million bounty put on our president's payroll. But in spite of that, in spite of that, there are certain scriptures that, that get a hope to you more than others. And, and this scripture today in Romans 8 is, is one of those scriptures. Many believers have scriptures that they consider to be verses of scripture that get through situations and circumstances. And I, I, I'm a believer that there are scriptures that every believer ought to retain when you're being challenged by the enemy of your soul. There, there ought to be a scripture, there ought to be a scripture that, that you have tucked away that can get you, that, that, that has been known to get you through some circumstances, been known to get you through some situations. There, you ought to have a scripture, you ought to have a, uh, something to hold you together. I'll never forget uh, Bishop Robinson be, before he passed, and he and I were, when I went up to his house and we were talking, and he said, Wait, he said, he said I, I didn't know how much scripture I had retained and, until I was going through this. And he said, He began just one scripture behind a, another, and God began to lift his heart as he began to uh, uh, risk scripture that he, had, that he had learned. And this is one of those scriptures. I'm a believer that there are scriptures that, that every believer ought to have. And I, and I must admit, as a pastor, I'm amazed at the excuses that people give concerning their shallow walk with God. What is further amazing is many try to hold claim to the promises of God without being willing to make the necessary commitments. We want the promise. And that's what I see happening in Christendom now, in, in the body. Uh, we, we, we want the promises of the word, and, 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 and we're looking for seven steps, seven easy steps, and turn around three times in the middle, and, and, and do this and do the other, and, and, and bring this and bring the other. We're, we're looking for easy ways, when all that God has called from you and I is a relationship. Is a relationship with him. And, and what's further amazing is many try to hold claim to the promises. And, and I, I have found myself on a regular basis encouraging the saints to hold on. Somebody say hold on. If there's ever been a time in our lives as believers to hold, it's now. It's now. It's a, it's a crazy, wicked world out here. Amen. And, and, and and we need to share with this, with this younger generation that, as I say many times, everybody's not your friend. Everybody's not your friend. So some have even become distracted by the delay of promises that they believe God has made them. The Bible says there's no temptation. And a temptation is anything that disturbs you or distracts you uh, or anything that causes you to doubt. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Somebody say faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape.
that you may be able to bear it and handle it or survive it. Look at somebody and say, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Now, in this eighth chapter, in this eighth chapter, and, and I, I beg of you to just give me time today. In this eighth, in this eighth chapter, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, of, of Romans being, uh, it was written as a, as a conclusion to the previous seven chapters. A study of Romans lets us know that the book of Romans can be divided into two parts, doctrinal and practical. Well, the doctrinal part of the book, instruction concerning the way of salvation. Paul speaks about being saved by grace, Gentile and Jew. And they, they, there were two areas that the Jews had difficulty comprehending. One was justification by faith, apart from the works of the law. They thought if they would fulfill the law, then that was salvation. Uh, but, 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 but they missed the, 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 the faith part of it all. And, and, and secondly, uh, first again, justification by, by faith apart from the works of the law. Secondly, the admission of the Gentiles into the church. Paul is very careful how he addresses the church at Rome because this was one of the areas that Paul never visited nor had he established a church there. And so because of their lack of understanding, he established some groundwork first. And one area was, was uh, he needed to establish his apostolic authority himself. Secondly, he expressed his personal feelings for the church and wanted, wanted them to know what was on his heart. And Paul was ready to discuss the gospel message Listen to what he said to them in chapter 1, verse 15. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He then paused for a moment and said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And that means continues to believe. After Paul deals with condemnation, after Paul deals with condemnation and justification and sanctification, he speaks of a word that says preservation. As Paul begins to write, he opens chapter 8 with no condemnation and closes the chapter with no separation. Every believer needs to take time and read Romans because it first shows that we're lost. Hallelujah. Shows that we're lost. And then it shows that we are saved. Saved means rescued. Amen. First, first God shows us that we are condemned. And then he gives us righteousness. And also assures us that he is able to keep us from falling. Paul goes on to let us know God has preserved us until the day of Jesus Christ. Then Paul makes mention of nine aspects of nine aspects of preservation. Not going to not going to preach them all nine cuz we will be here until Bible study. Well, I'll be here by myself, but <laughs> uh, but he he speaks of nine aspects of preservation. The, uh, these are important to the walk of every believer. And this, this is the glue that should hold us together when we're going through things. One is we're preserved in the Son of God. That's one. Two, preserved in the Spirit of God. Thirdly, we're preserved in the family of God. Then we're preserved in the promises of God. And then we're preserved in the prayer of God. And number six, we're preserved in the providence of God. Then we're preserved in the purpose of God. And number eight, we're preserved in the power of God. Finally, we're preserved in the love of God. Something to be noticed here is the preservation is all in Christ Jesus. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So I submit to you, every believer needs to understand being preserved. Oh, bless his name. When you feel like the enemy of your soul, 
has your file, knows everything about you, and is throwing everything at you, remember you've been preserved. Oh, bless his name. Uh, my mother-in-law used to, uh, used to, uh, um, uh, uh, what's it called, used to um, uh, put, put, put preserves in the jars and, and put them down in the basement. And, and, and of course, when you, when you go down there, after a while of it being down there, it looked like somebody's lungs and somebody's heart everything else is in there. And, and the jar is, is dirty on the outside and, and dusty from sitting down there for such a long time. But the contents, Lord have mercy. The, what's in, in, inside of the jar has been preserved. The outside might have some cracks and might, have, might get sick sometime and might have some issues going on in life. But the inside, somebody say the inside. The inside is preserved. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he preserved me. I'm glad that he's keeping me. I'm glad that he's covering me. I'm glad he's protecting me. I'm just convinced. That's all I'm, I'm convinced. So when I look at this, I, I submit to you, every believer needs to understand pre preserved. When you feel like the enemy of your soul knows everything about you, re remember your Preserved. Now, to be preserved is to be kept from harm and danger. To be kept safe. It means to protect. It, it means to protect for personal use. To be saved and protected from danger. I, I don't think the saints of God really understand preservation. Oh, bless his name. Paul is telling the Roman Christians not even the worst that life has to offer can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, when you look at chapter 5 of Romans through chapter 8, all of these chapters, 5 through 8, close with in Christ Jesus or through Christ Jesus. And this emphasizes that everything God has for us in him and through him. And the Bible says, in him, in him we move. And in him we have our being. It, it was imperative that Paul emphasized to the Christians at Rome that nothing that the enemy had to offer would be able to separate us from the love of God. I want to encourage the, the body of Christ I, I, because I... I see the weariness on faces. Uh, things are happening that, that, that things have finally come to our house. <laughs> People are going through some, some things that, uh, and it's not that it's not supposed to happen, but it's come to your house. Some of you heard uh, the, uh, the eulogy I gave my father. I had trouble understanding because nobody, nobody told the preacher that it will come to your house one day You're, because the preacher is always trying to help somebody else, sit with somebody else and stand by the casket and help you close the lid and all those other kind of things. Nobody told me. Now I know you said, Pastor, that's, that's kind of stupid. No, that's not stupid. Uh, nobody told me. I didn't learn that in preaching class. What happened was, was this. Now, now it comes down to the same things I've been preaching to you. Now I have to be faced with it. Y'all not going to help me today. Oh, bless his name. Paul is telling the Christian Romans, not even the worst that life has to offer can separate us from the love of God. It's in him that we live and move. Not only was he encouraging them about, about how to be committed to God and, and, and that God would see them through, but he was also saying, in spite of all this, God will see you through. Can I testify to tell you that not too many days ago, I was burning in my spirit, but God in Christ Jesus. Lord have mercy. That's what I had to rely on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, I'm not talking about you went and got a, got, a, got a drink and got some Hennessy trying to forget all the trouble and, and, you, and you left the, left the graveyard and had to get a drink and all. No, no, I, I wasn't looking for no drink. I was looking for that Holy Spirit that I've been preaching about for 40 years now. I needed the Spirit of God 
for myself. Y'all ain't gonna help me now. I needed the power of God for myself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever needed the power of God at a difficult time in your life? Not only was he encouraging them about how committed God is to see them through, but saying in spite of it, just for a moment, think about the many times God loved you through some stuff. Think about how many times God spoke peace to your circumstance. This has to be what Paul meant when he wrote Romans 8 and 18. For I reckon, <laughs> my pastor of Curry Shamer's favorite scripture, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You have heard me say many times that reckon is an accounting term. But it also means to weigh mentally. In other words, think about the times of discouragement since you've been saved and yet God spoke encouragement. Think about the trials and, and just the circumstances of life and yet God has been faithful. Mm. In the 19th verse, Paul speaks about the earnest expectations. To earnestly expect means to watch anxiously. One writer said it means to have to have your have your neck outstretched with expectancy. One one writer said it, it's 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 watching with an uplifted head. Well, the psalmist said on one occasion, "I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not suffer." your foot to be moved. Oh my God, my God. Now that, that must be where, uh, where the psalmist, uh, where the psalmist, where the worship leader, Asaph, faith, where he said, my foot, my foot almost slipped. Glory to God, God, if I didn't know you like I know you. Now I want to tell you something, I'm, I'm kind of restraining myself because I, I feel like really preaching like I really feel like preaching, but, but, but God, 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 when I look at this thing, and I begin to think it over because trouble is a mental intrusion. And so the enemy would like to have you and I trouble. And we are trouble on every side. God, help me here. But then God says, I am your comforter. I am your peace. A little over a month ago, I needed to hear the voice of God. Kind of restrained by myself here now. I couldn't even go back to my parents' house. And maybe, maybe some of y'all think, well, with that I said, no, no. I know me. And I hope I'm helping somebody in here to today. I could not go back to the house yet. And I kept saying that I'm going, and my wife kept saying, you, you, you need to go. And 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 I said, I, I will at some point in time, but I and I call mom every day, check on her every day. Then, then, then in her prayers, I called and she said, I was waiting for you to call. I need you to come by. Ah, uh, ah, uh, wasn't ready for this yet, Deacon Warren. I wasn't ready for this yet. I, was, I wasn't there yet. And I know some of you are saying, but Pastor, you've been doing this for a long time. Listen, that, that, that don't mean nothing. You've been brushing your teeth a long time and your teeth still fell out. I just thought I'd say that. <laughs> but this thing was, 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 was uh, I heard Bishop, uh, uh, Elder Alvin Baker preach one time, don't let them get under your skin. Well, this stuff had gotten under my skin. And so I found myself, if I stayed busy, I was all right. But when I stopped being busy, it bothered me. But then I found out, then I realized, I didn't find out, I realized I have the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I wish I had a praying church right here. Does anybody know about the Holy Ghost? 
I know we call it the Holy Spirit now and it's proper for the Holy Spirit, but I still like Casper. The Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It was the Holy Ghost that saved me. It was the Holy Ghost that raised me. It was the Holy Ghost that touched my mind. It was the Holy Ghost that keeps my mind. Somebody throw your head back and say, the Holy Ghost. Ah, ah, I got hallelujah. It was the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost. Clap those hands and give God a praise right there. Yeah. Hallelujah. I submit to you that this is, oh Lord, look at the time. I submit to you, this is a season where the saints of God, hear me out, Lincolnia, we need to encourage one another. Too much infighting. Too much action. Oh, y'all not going to say much now, see? <laughs> and all it's doing is breaking down the power of God in our lives. That's all it's doing. But we need the Holy Ghost. I wish I could pause right here. God, I feel like preaching now. Uh, Elder Dwight said I went away and got some rest, and I did. I rested for the last three days. I laid on the beach of St. Lucia and slept every time I could sleep. I slept trying to eat, I slept. Face almost fell in my plate half the time, but I, but, but, but I knew I needed some rest, and by the time I got home, I was ready now. Hallelujah. Got some fresh energy. Got, got some new strength now. Hallelujah. Always had it, but I said, God, I need a refilling of your Holy Ghost. I need your power. I need your anointing. I need your Lord. Give God a praise right there. Well, I better close this. I better close it. I submit to you this season where the saints of God need to encourage one another, need to encourage themselves, need to realize that we need the power of God in our lives. It is the season where the saints of God need to encourage one another. Paul said, who shall separate me? from the power or from the love of Christ. There must be, there, there must be a determination to hold out and to hold on. Will you help me preach for the next five minutes and touch your neighbor and say, hold on and hold out. Help is on the way. The Bible says, Jesus said, preach Bishop, Jesus said, I'm going away but I'm going to send you a comforter. The power of the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but I need the power. I need the anointing. I need the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yes. Uh. Well, I better get out of here now. Paul said, who shall separate me? From the love of Christ, there must be a determination. There are times that these are the times that will try our souls. Your position in Jesus Christ is being challenged. But make up your mind. I'll let nothing. Uh-oh. I'll let nothing separate me. Not a thing. Nothing includes anything that comes to upset your peace. Nothing, you must be determined that nothing will separate you. Paul begins to list things that can upset us emotionally. He begins with tribulation and distress. And this simply means being in a tight bind. Some are struggling financially. 
Some are looking for a better job, looking for better income. I'm in a, a bind. Things are pressing me. When I get to yours, you, you can shout amen. It's all right. Things are pressing you. Dealing with some hard circumstances. Almost feeling like there's no way out. Paul says, not even tribulation or distress. Then he says, well, let's look at persecution. Persecution seems like the attack of the enemy of your soul just won't stop. Every time you turn around, something is coming at me. Am I helping anybody yet? Every time I look around, here comes something else. Oh, my God. I hope they don't mind me using them as an example, but, but the Jones family has had their hands full for the last month or so with, with one passing of, of another. First Sister Pat's mother, then, then a niece, and now another, another relative. And, and now the Muffer family is going through some things uh, right now. Doctors have sat us down and talked about my brother who's in the nursing home right now. We don't, don't know what's going to come next. Seems like there's one thing out there. Sometimes, can I, can I be transparent? Uh, sometimes, some, uh, sometimes I just want to stay home and, and come around in time to preach on Sunday morning. <laughs> but I know I can't because the souls that are, I'm looking at right now have been entrusted to my hands. Oh, bless his name. And just like you go through, I go through. Just got a bill the other day from Pico, I got one too. They had no respect to persons. <laughs> they blessed me with a bill just like they blessed you with a bill. Amen. But if we join up, and earnestly pray one for another. Oh, y'all not going to hear me today. And earnestly join with one another. And say, you pray for me. And I'll pray for you. I told the saints in St. Lucia, I made the altar call. And because the message dealt with the family. And, 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 and so, so I told them, I said, I tell you what. Let's make a bargain to be, 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 between each other. Let's, let, let's pray for one another's children. And I said, I'm pointing to one sister. I said, uh, uh, you have a daughter? She said, yes. I said, what's her name? She told me her name. I said, I got a daughter. I got daughters too. I said, I tell you what. I pray for daughter. You pray for my daughter. And I had them go around and say, you pray for my son. And I'll pray for your son. You pray for my aunt. Uh, my aunt I'll pray for your aunt. You pray for my drunk Uncle Willie. I'll pray for your drunk Uncle Willie. Because every family got a drunk Uncle Willie. And by the time we finished, prayer had filled that place. And that's what we got to get back in the church. We got to get the spirit of prayer and the power of prayer and the anointing of prayer because there are bodies that need to be miraculously healed. And they can't be healed in a negative atmosphere. Paul says, what about persecution? Seems like the attack of the enemy of our soul just won't let up. And Paul says, nothing. Somebody say nothing. Yeah. I'm, I'm convinced. Then he says, what about famine? Check your Bible. I'm in your word. Famine. You ought to tell your circumstances. I will live off the word of God. Famine. But my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, let's look at nakedness. Feels like you have lost the covering of God. 
Paul says, but he will supply all of my needs. But God will not leave you uncovered during your difficult days. I hope I'm helping somebody today. Then Paul says, hey, what about peril? Peril is that like that perilous times, danger. Well, what about danger? It means surrounded by danger and spiritual attack where the enemy is constantly threatening your safety. Then Paul says, well, after I've covered those, I got a few more. What about sword? Well, feels like the enemy is cutting at the core of my being. My father passed. I, I felt somebody had never Didn't know where that, where that feeling came from. He said, well, what about the cutting? What about the sword? He's trying out what God has put in. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm convinced that I'll let nothing separate me. Devil's trying to cut out your joy. And, and, and I, I was praying, even coming home on the plane, coming back was a much better flight, but going, I, I, I want to be perfectly honest with you, and, and Sister White can verify, the plane took, made a move that I have never experienced in my life. It made a quick right move like it was, I looked over at Sister Rita, she looked at me, and after 40 some years, you, you know what looks mean. We had empty seat in between us. And all kinds of went through my head. Y'all looking at me. You, you, you got the same thing. All kinds of thoughts ran through my head. Enemy was trying to cut some stuff out of me. Cut some things out. What happened, I was so emotionally and mentally drained that I needed some rest. Because when you don't rest, you can't identify the schemes of the enemy. The sword. He's trying to cut out your, your joy and, and your peace and your love and your long suffering. Then Paul says, then Paul says, we are more than We read that and just read by it. How can you be more than? Isn't conqueror enough? We like to read that. We, we, we like to recite it. We act like we know it. We act like we read our Bible and, and, and we know it. But he says, no, we're more than conquerors. In other words, none of that stuff ever bothers God. We're more than conquerors. Well, there are some things we'll have to go through for the cause of Christ and towards the gospel. But in the midst of Paul's instructions, now he starts to give God praise. <laughs> he says, I'm persuaded. I'm convinced that nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God. Paul now gets caught up in praising. He starts searching the universe for anything that could possibly separate us. He goes on to the realms of death. He looks at death, searches it, and says there's nothing that can separate us. He goes to the realm of, of death, and he looks at it and searches it and says there's nothing. He turns to the realm of life. He finds nothing there. He looks to the angelic and spiritual world. And finds nothing there. Here's the part I like. Elder Jones, I like this. He looks at the other side. He looks at principalities. Which represent Satan himself. And all his demons. And Paul with his bold self says, nothing. I won't even allow that to separate me. Then he begins to examine things present. And he finds nothing. Then he looks at the future, things to come. 
But as he considers what could happen in the future that might try to separate us, he says, I find nothing. Saints of God, I, I just wanted to encourage you today because I see and sense the weariness. And if we're not careful, we'll start taking it out on each other. If we're not careful. You ever been mad at somebody else? But then somebody else walks up, they ain't got nothing to do with you being mad. They just came at the wrong time. <laughs> Might sound comical, but it's real. But we got to make up our mind that we'll let nothing separate us from the love of God. Someone sent me a, a text or an email after my father's home going and said, you have no idea the release that you brought to me with your transparency about how you were feeling. One person came to me while they were having a repast and, and leaned down. I know, I, I know who, who, who the woman was. Lean down, got in my ear. I said, oh, hey, baby. <laughs> Let's get a little close now. I said, and she said, she said, I've been angry for close to four years now after the passing of my husband. She said, I've been angry with God. I've been angry with people. She said, but when I heard what you said today, being a preacher of the gospel, you released me today. And, and, and I still had a difficult time comprehending, but I said, you released me today. The anger left me. Because the anger was stopping me from praying. Hear me good, saints of God. Not only that situation, but we could, we, we could be having situations with one another. And it will dictate your worship. It will dictate your praise. You'll sit there with your arms folded because you don't, you don't really care for the one that's leading it. Or somebody told you something and rather than you investigate to get the truth, you just went with it. And that happens more than anything else. We just go with it. I like to deal with it like this. I, I tell you what you do. Bring them. I'm telling you I didn't say it. You saying you heard it. Bring who you heard it from. Let's sit down. I said, now, now let me tell you. Let me help you now. They ain't coming. They're not coming with you. All they've done is got you riled up, hit a spot in you, and now you running my daddy would say, but wild, another word on the street, but in, in, in here. Now you're running wild about it without any real evidence of anything. Bring them. Let's, let, let's, let's sit, bring them. I've not had one person ever return with a third person in 30 some years. Saints, I'm convinced that the enemy of my soul has now pulled out his best arsenal. But the Bible says, I'll let nothing separate me from the love of God. There will be times when you'll feel forgotten. There will be times. I'm sure my, my brother and my sister, my wife, and even my children will remember me saying this on many occasions. Deacon John, I said, after running dad to hospital appointments and, I mean, to doctor appointments, I said that I never said, said it to Deacon Frank or Charlene. I said, I said, I think we need to face the reality that the day is coming 
and dad will not be coming back home with us. That hurts so much to say. little problem with God for a moment. Because when you call me, like Jeremiah said, Lord, you didn't tell me all this stuff. <laughs> Jeremiah said, God, you didn't tell me that, first of all, the people you sent me to would act the way they act. Check your words. You, you didn't tell me. He said, I, I'm in derision, I think is, is the word. And so Jeremiah then says, well, I tell you what, I, I ain't going to talk about your goodness no more. I'm not going to talk about your mercy and your grace no more. I, I ain't going to do it. He said, and even when I thought about that, it was too much for me to comprehend. He said, because your word was like fire. Shut up. I'm convinced. Saints, in this world, we are troubled on every side. But God has given us a way out. Now, some of you are going to have trouble with this one, but let me tell you what your way out is. Each other. Each other. folks say, I, I, don't, I don't need them church people. But that's where you go wrong right there. Because I, I, I'm not a church person. If God has not called me to the church, as we know the church, we look at the building and, yeah, this is the church building. But that's not what he called me to. I come to tell you. If you're not careful, our feet will slip. I'm standing in Deacon Marshall's room that yesterday. And I tell you, his, his nephew came by, he's a pastor of the Church of God in Christ in uh, Pleasantville, he said. And he said, Bishop, he said, uh, and we've been talking about pastoring, of course, and Sharon said this story, Christian story about pastoring. And he said, Bishop, he said, uh, the problem is the Bible says that hell has enlarged itself. It doesn't say heaven has enlarged itself. And I knew where he was going because the road to heaven is narrow. But people have chosen sin. So hell has enlarged itself. And then it goes on to say, and the word of God says that hell was never prepared for God's people. It was prepared for Satan and his angels. But because of what we chose. Now I know this old time preacher, but I want to tell you something. Sometimes I want to pull the old chairs out and say, get out here and tarry. We got enough towels and sheets. But hell has enlarged itself because of sin. Didn't say heaven has been enlarged because so many souls are being saved. Think about that for a moment. But I'm convinced. I'm going to stop right there. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor principalities and powers will be able to separate you. Stand with me and let's pray this quickly. We want to separate you from the love of God. This is pastoral to sheep. Hear me good now. Pastor was a little long today, and then Pastor deserves the right to be long. But since I don't see you from Sunday to Sunday, I deserve the right to see you today. Just take a second. 
It's a challenging word. You run the risk of long-term believers writing it off. That was for somebody. That's what you run the risk of doing. If you've ever, if you've spent time ob observing over the years and even when I've gone other places, I've had no problem responding to Paul's as being one of the ministers they're visiting. Because when the word comes, there's a reason why God wanted me to hear what I heard. And so when the altar call comes, I've come out the pulpit on many occasions and went down to the altar. People people have, have asked me, you, you're a bishop. I say, yeah, that's why I'm at this altar. That's why I'm at this altar. Because there's more required of me than of you. And Paul made a statement. Paul said that after I preached to others, after I preached to others, after I've sweat out my and lost some hair, and, and now the hair that's growing back in is coming back in gray. After all of that, you got saved, and then I find myself lost. Whew. It's a terrible feeling. I'm not even going to call for certain things that, for you to come to the altar. If you feel the necessity after this word to come to, to this altar, the altar's open for, for you now. Sing me something one time through, and I'm going to pray. Sing.